Good morning, everybody. Cut out the handy woman loom again today. <clears throat> I do want to show you something on the saffron loom, the numerics loom, which I've seen a couple of people asking questions about. So I know Elena has made a video about the thing I'm going to show you, which is about the tension, but um, I actually couldn't find it this morning. So um, I will find it and put a link in the on the page that is right. Um, on the screen. I'm taking this um, silk out. I don't like it. Um, I let it sit for a few days and um, this is that little window piece I was working on last week and I just don't like it. And so after a week and I still don't like it, I'm taking it out. If I had finished the piece, I wouldn't, of course, not take it out. I would just leave it. But since I haven't worked on it, coming out. Oh, and this is where I started with a lark's head. <laughs> lark's head knot. Okay. I need better light. It's that. I don't actually take things out that often um, on little pieces because I just do another one. But in this case, I couldn't stand it. So out it comes. And looks like I used a lark head on that too. I don't remember what day I was doing this, but um, way back last week I showed how I was starting that with a lark's head knot. Um, okay, so now I have to um, somehow stabilize that because I'm using a weft that's actually way too thin for this set. If I don't put some knots in there, I'm actually gonna leave an opening and if I don't stabilize it somehow, I will regret it later. So this is, um, I think that's what, oh, this is actually not what I thought it was. I was looking for um, upholstery thread and this is not it, but this will probably work. It's just regular sewing thread in black. And I'm just gonna do double half hitches. I want it to disappear, so Oops. Just gonna do a row of double half hitches along the bottom of this. Upholstery thread is a little thicker than this. Actually, I could use, you know what? Let's do that instead. Let's actually use, because it's so thin, let's just use the um, Weaver's Bazaar yarn to do the half hitches because it will definitely be the same color then. The idea with the thread is that it's <clears throat> small enough that it disappears and you don't see it. But with this being the same color, it won't show either. <clears throat> I hope you all are doing well on this Thursday. You are here from all over the place, I'm sure. <clears throat> um, 
all over Washington and Sweden and Kansas and Minnesota in Kansas, in Vancouver. <clears throat> I even did my vocal exercises this morning and I'm still um, having voice issues. I apologize. Oh, that's cool, Susan. Um, she was greeting um, Evelyn in Sweden, but she took her first um, tapestry class in 1971 with uh, someone that I don't recognize, but... Um, in Sweden, that's very cool. Hello, Pueblo. I love Colorado. Hello, Idaho. I also love Moscow, Idaho. What a cool town that is. Don't y'all go um, running out there, but um, hi to Sarah. Ooh, fringeless warp. Okay. I actually was going to do a fringeless warp tomorrow. We'll see if that happens or not. Don't hold me to it. Um. Cool. You guys, thanks for passing along stuff like, you know, where's the local tapestry group? And I think that's really fantastic. Um, if you can hook up that way, um, it's fun to have friends in your community that you can go and um, hang out with and weave and support each other and <clears throat> figure out new ways of doing stuff. And, um Ooh, let's turn off that. Let's see if that helps. Okay. I still had my green screen on from yesterday. Um, the green screen was fun, but it was a little disorienting to me. So, you know, I went back to my regular studio today. Uh, okay, great. Welcome, everybody. Um, oh, you know, Judy, that's a really great question. Thank you for asking. Um, She's in Nashville, and she says, what is double weave tapestry versus double tapestry mentioned by James in chapter 10 of his book? That is a question I get all the time, and uh, it's one of my deepest regrets um, in terms of things that I never asked James. So James Kohler was my teacher. I was um, an apprentice of his for several years, um, right before he died in 2011. And um, he wrote a book called Woven Color, which is um, really a great weave. If you can get your hands on a copy, um, I will drop a link into the, um, if I make myself a note, I will drop a link into the, um, this page that's right above my head here. I'm putting links on, so I'll put James's book link, because it's a little hard to find. Um, it's on Blurb. If you can find a copy from your guild, or if you can afford to buy a copy, it's really a great, um, I think it's a great book. Anyway, he was my teacher, and... Um, he mentioned something called double tapestry. And I have um, actually heard other apprentices describe what that is, and they have a better grasp of it than I do. Um, double weave, um, double weave tapestry, um, double weave is a structure where you're making two layers of cloth and you can bring up, or sometimes three or four, done on a shaft loom and you can bring up colors from an underneath layer to show on the top. Um, double weave is not tapestry. You do see the warp and the weft. Um, I'm not sure that, yeah, tapestry weave doesn't have any sort of double weave connotations. What I think James is talking about, um, and those of you, <clears throat> I'm really, really sorry. Um, those of you who have a better grasp of it than me. Um, I can't remember who. Um, anyway, I don't know. My brain doesn't work anymore. But um, he's um, playing with colors. And I think he's playing with two sets, but in a different way than I was doing yesterday on that piece that's behind me, um, the hot flash piece. Um, so actually, Judy, I don't have, <laughs> sorry, I don't have an answer. I'll actually look up that page on in his book and um, look at it again. But he's playing with colors. He it was using a Rothko piece in that example, a piece that was inspired by Rothko's paintings. And he's using um, a weft that sort of rides under the weft on top somehow to create a look of two different colors. So my feeling is that it's something like um, what Helena Herrnmark does in her work, which is stunning and um, is very different from traditional tapestry, where she has a, 
a, we a tapestry weft underneath that can be a different color from um, yarns that are floating on the top and it creates this really amazing 3D effect. So if you don't know um, Helena Herrenmark, please go look her up. Um, it's the same kind of idea and uh, Helena's work is, is phenomenal. She's um, really amazing. Yes, Kit, this is 12 EPI on this little Handy Woman loom. It's 12 EPI. It's a six dent loom that I've doubled. You got it. Um, yeah, sorry to be so vague about the James Kohler thing. I'll, um, I'll revisit that chapter, and if I have a better answer for you tomorrow, I'll let you know. I know people have emailed me about it who've played with what they think he was doing, so if I can find that information, I'll um, share it because I think it is really interesting. But it's not double weave at all. Double weave is the kind of thing that um, Jennifer Moore does, which she has um, a couple amazing books and Jennifer's fantastic. Um, um, Ruth is reminding me um, or reminding all of you there's been some emails about a thing that ATA and the British Tapestry Group are doing together um, about applauding all the people, um, <clears throat> all the people working in healthcare and everything else. So there's a lot of tapestries going around with hands in them and that kind of thing. It's a fun thing to jump on. It's just using hashtags to share some work about um, sharing our um, appreciation for everyone who's working so hard. Um, if I can find, I was looking, I got an email from ATA yesterday. I was looking for a way to forward that to Facebook and I um, doesn't seem possible, but I think ATA is posting other things. So thanks, Ruth. Ruth is in the UK and is on the British Tapestry Group side of all of that, which is also a great group. Definitely look at their website. Um, great. Welcome, all you guys. Um, every Guys, it's a bad habit of mine to say all you guys. It's really not great. Sorry. Um, Mary Lou, yeah. Helena used to use Rose Path, but it's not... You guys can argue with me about this because I don't know the most about weave structures, but I don't... She used Rose Path early in her work. Now, um, I actually took a workshop with her in 2012 at the American Swedish Institute, and it's not... She doesn't use a rose path treadling anymore. It's just straight treadling with um, a tapestry ground and then a sumac float on the top. But you can see the warp. And <clears throat> lots of people um, still say that she uses rose path. If anybody has worked with Helena recently, you could correct me on that. But I believe that it's not, it doesn't really matter. But she used to use rose path, um, which is a, a certain pattern treadling sequence for shaft looms. Um, now she can do all of her structure with two shafts. Or maybe she still does both, I don't know. Um, oh, Janet. Um, husband wants to know what I'm using for a switcher. That's a great question. Um, Janet, email me and I'll tell you, I'll send you a link. I warn you, it only works on Mac, though, so if he doesn't use a Mac, he'll have to find something else. But I'm sure there are other programs. Um, so uh, this is, let me show you, whoops. Even though I've been using this for a month, I still hit the wrong buttons. Let me just show you the thing I wanted to show you on um, the Mirax, and then I can come back to this loom. This is this is the, um, I'm gonna have to back this out. This is the saffron loom, and I've actually put a longer threaded rod on it. This is the one it comes with, which is this long. And I wanted a few more inches to do a longer piece. Actually, to be honest, I probably won't do a longer piece. Um, this might be three inches. I just like having the extra warp. It makes a really big difference in how easy it is to um, weave on a loom. So the question I'm seeing a lot is that people are having difficulty tightening this loom. And it's, I'm going to zoom in here. Um, remember that these 
wing nuts are working in pairs. So if you loosen the tension, if I want it tighter, say I warped it and it's at this tension and it's too loose for me and I want it tighter, I have to loosen the top first. So even loosen it so there's space in there and then tighten the bottom one. And this one I can tighten as tight as, sorry, I need this to be, I need, oh, I need more space. Um, tighten this as tight as you can get it with this one loose. So um, with the loom face down like this, I can get this so tight. This is way too tight. This is really, really tight. And I'm just using my fingers and my hands are not actually all that strong. You could use a wrench though if you have a particular issue with your hands. Um, I haven't tried it. I wonder if the Mirex wrenches that they send for the bigger wing nets would work. They might be too, um, they might be too big. But uh, you could try um, just a pair of, a small pair of needle nose pliers. And then once it's at the tension you want it to be at, so that's pretty good, then tighten this one, the top one down. That just holds it all secure. The top one honestly is probably not even necessary, but um, make sure you un loosen the tension here before you tighten the tension there. And then I have a really good tight tension on the whole warp. Um, I don't know if that's the confusion, but I've been seeing quite a few people saying that they're frustrated that they can't get the tension tight. And I just wanted to make sure you know that um, those two nuts are working in pairs. And if you don't loosen one of them, you're not gonna get the tension tighter because there's nowhere for the top bar to move upwards. So hopefully that helps. I don't want you to be frustrated. Um, Cool. So good, I'm glad I'm not the only one who takes out things. I'm gonna go back to this. And, oh, thank you, Susan. She was clarifying my gaffe about um, the Sweden, um, the thing she was talking about was actually a weaving school which is wonderful. I actually considered briefly going to study with Helena in Sweden. She occasionally teaches in Sweden for two weeks at a time. And um, I really wanted to go. And I chickened out because the, um, well, first of all, it was happening in like a month and I couldn't work it out. But um, it was all in Swedish. And I chickened out because I... Um, was afraid of going and not being able to speak Swedish, but to be honest, it would have been fine because I'm sure many people there spoke English and they would have helped me learn some Swedish. So I regret missing that opportunity, but I think Helena does occasionally still teach in Sweden, which is where her tapestries are mostly woven at a uh, workshop in Sweden. Okay, so I did, can you see that? Probably not. I just put in a row of double half hitches right there to hold that in. And I'm gonna trim that. And then when I get to the top of this window, I'm gonna do another row of those. And actually, I don't know whether I will do it before or after weaving the rest of it. This is that little piece with hand spun. Which, um, again, the weft is way too thin for this warp. You can see that um, if I hold it up, I don't know if you can, there, the, um, the weft is, it should fill that space between the warp and it's about half the size that it should be. Feel it necessary to say that so that you don't look at this and think that my warp weft ratio is correct because it is not. Uh, 
Um, Dorothy asked, can I spell um, Helena's last name? Yes, it's um, Hernmark, H-E-R-N-M-A-R-C-K. It's a beautiful website. And um, I'm feeling really bad about my comment about the rose path. I'm really sorry about saying that. I feel like I was being a know-it-all and snarky. Um, while I do think it's true that she doesn't use rose path anymore, it doesn't actually really matter. So I apologize. Um, you know that human need to be right about things? It bites me in the butt a lot, especially about tapestry stuff. So I apologize for that. Someone, someone will know and tell me. Someone will email me and let me know if I'm right or wrong about that. And again, it doesn't really matter. She's using shafts um, to control the tapestry in her work. So, Janet, you might, that might be true. So Janet um, Austin is saying um, it might be a form of brocade, which could well be true, Janet. And this is where my lack of knowledge of other weave structures. I know a lot about double weave and a little bit about lace and a little bit about a few other weave structures. But for the most part, I never studied, um, you know, brocading and rose path. And I did a little bit of like summer and winter and um, M's and O's and those kind of things like 20 years ago. So my knowledge falls down when it comes to what do we really call um, the structure she's using, and it could be a type of brocade. It's really fascinating, um, the effects that she gets with it. Um, web size versus warp, Lori, good question. Um, there is... Uh, I wrote a bunch of blog posts about um, set, and I'll put a link on that website, um, which actually details it pretty well. The um, weft, there's different ways to figure out what weft size you're going to use for a warp set, but that thing where you hold, um, let's see if I can find a fatter yarn. Here. Um, that thing where you hold the weft. So this actually, this is Shetland, High, um, Harrisville Shetland. This is actually a good, and this warp is actually the same size. This would be a fairly good size yarn for 12 ends per inch. So if I hold the yarn vertically up against the warp, it visually is filling that space between two warps. So this yarn is, this Harrisville Shetland is at least twice the size of this hand spun I'm using. It would be a much better size for this um, for this warp set. But I'll link that blog post because it has a lot more information about. Trial and error is not a bad thing either, but knowing what you're looking for while you're doing the trial and error can be helpful. Like what are the things that don't work if you don't get the set and the materials to match? Oh, look at those little red dots. Um, endlessly fascinated by hand spun. Oh, Maureen, good question. That extended rod on the Mirex is, it looks like it is about 16 inches long. It might be 15 and a half, something like that. It gave me like an extra four inches. And I think it's quarter inch threaded rod. Um, it is really nice to have a longer warp. It's just so much easier to weave on. For small things on small looms, like this I'm not having any trouble with because I still have a fair amount of warp here, but I will. this is only two inches high. I'm not gonna weave way up here because it's too frustrating to me to not have that space. I just don't like 
struggling so much to weave when I could just use a bigger loom. Copper pipe, that's how my copper pipe looms multiply. Um, oh, see, that was a total error there. Um, you probably aren't gonna be able to see that, so. I brought this um, bit of hand spun all the way over into that brown outline. In error. Okay. This is probably super tedious to watch, but um, it's kind of fun to weave. Yeah, Kara, I think you were one that I saw a comment from on Facebook. We were talking about the um, Mirax loom. I think it would help if you try, lay the loom face down um, to tighten it. I find that that helps tremendously because it gives you some leverage against the wing nut. And um, Kate is also saying use a vice grip or something if you're having trouble with your hands not feeling strong enough. Um, I'm the person who can never get the jars open which makes me feel like my hands aren't all that strong, but it might just be that that particular motion of my, that's a rotational motion and I just don't have a lot of strength in that way, but I think most of us don't. Many women don't have the leverage to open jars because our hands, are, here's the occupational therapist talking, because we just have smaller hands, although my hands are pretty big. So it's probably not a good excuse, but. Um, we don't have the leverage because our bones are shorter. Um, so the larger the jar lid, the harder it can be to get them off because they're just, we don't have the, the physics isn't working for us. Where you hand the jar to your brother-in-law who has hands that are an inch longer than, fingers that are an inch longer than yours and he has no trouble opening it. It's just because of leverage, not because he's stronger. Um, I think at some point Merrick's will probably offer a longer bar as a as an option if you want it to match your um, loom. So um, match just meaning that it's the same material that they're using for the other thing. I don't think it matters as long as it fits in that hole and. Okay, what am I doing? Um, <laughs> Janet, Janet, you're making me laugh. Um, Janet says, any reason not to double that too thin weft? Um, no, yes. Um, so my reason not to double it is because it's hand spun and I wanna see this kind of color change. That's what's fascinating me about it. And that really the only reason I'm weaving with it, it's not a really appropriate yarn. It would be far better if I doubled it in terms of structure. Absolutely. But the colors would not do this. They would be all dotted and mixed up because um, I didn't spin it in a way where I intended to do that. You could maybe make a yarn. Um, it would be hard to make a two ply yarn where the colors changed, unless you could make a three ply with a chain um, by chain plying, but which would have been an option here. I guess I could have chain plied, but this yarn um, changes colors subtly and frequently. And so um, I'm not even sure that chain plying would really have worked because um, I would have lost all the subtlety to it. So it was just about the color. Um, it wasn't really about anything other than that. But no, structurally, no reason why I wouldn't have doubled that. That would have been a, a good choice. Um, oh yeah, Mary Lou, good. You're completely right about back to Helena Herrenmark. Um, uh, she used colored linen warps, which um, I felt really lucky to be able to see her show at the American Swedish Institute in, it was 2012. Um, she's probably had shows since then, but there must have been, what, did anyone go? How many pieces were there? It The whole place was full of her work. And yeah, you could see that the warps, she had changed the colors of the warps 
Um, and because the warps were showing in places, um, it really helped. She had reasons for it, which I'm not going to be able to articulate, but um, really helped the feeling of the overall piece. So um, that's a great tip there, Mary Lou. Um, color changes. So she would change the warp color also. Um, Oh, yeah, and Helena Hernmark does have, there is a book out about um, her and her work, which is a beautiful book. It is, I think, from the late 90s. I think you're right, um, Mary Lou. Oh, yeah, so Janet, that seems to describe her work, that a simple brocade, brocade is a plain weave with a decorative supplemental weft that sits on top. That describes Helena's work very well to me, that she has a plain weave, tapestry plain weave. Actually, it's not. It's not really weft faced because you see the warp. And then there's this supplemental um, weft that's fatter that goes on top and it makes this magical 3D effect. <laughs> Angie, thank you. I will stop apologizing. That's probably more annoying than me apologizing, huh? Um, see, I did it again. I just apologized. I'm working. I'm working on myself a little bit at a time. Um, I don't know, Mary. So Mary's asking a good question about, let me move this back to, she's asking about, can you do um, a fringe list on this warp um, with the extended rod? And maybe because it has tension, I think it would be tricky, Mary, but I don't think it would be impossible. Um, the thing about the fringeless technique that Sarah Sweat and I teach in our online course is that you have a jig that sits in here that holds the um, weft, and then there's a supplemental warp that goes on. I'm sorry, that holds the warp. I think it might be possible. It just might be a little tricky to set up. I'm going to say maybe especially with an extended rod. I would definitely use a longer rod. I think it would be easier, but. Um. Oh, Mandy, that's actually a great question. She's saying, am I using the same number of um, passes here on this one with the hand spun as with this Weaver's Bazaar? And no, and that's true of the piece I was um, working on yesterday too. So I just, when I didn't say it out loud, but um, I was putting an extra pass of the, the hand spun is actually thinner than this is Weaver's Bazaar. This is just their regular 18-2 wool and it's thicker than the hand spun. So every occasionally I'm putting an extra um, sequence of the hand spun in there. And um, so no, I'm not necessarily doing an even number. Um, it's close, but because the hand spun is thinner, I am actually putting some extra sequences, a full sequence, which is over and back, not just a pick because that will mess up the meet and separate. Yeah, Maureen is saying her, um, and I don't actually know what the threaded rod is. Her threaded rod is 5 16th inch, so double check before you buy the longer rod. Mirex actually sent me that longer rod, so I, of course, knew it was going to fit. Um, I think they'll have accessories where they will sell the longer rod, and I don't, maybe they already do, but um, one thing that I was asking for that I think they might sell to everybody, so. Oh, Kathleen. I should scan through and see everybody's comments first. Kathleen says they're already selling it, so this the 14 inch bar, and maybe that is what this is. Hold on, I'll measure better. Um, this probably is what this is. So this is coming out to me to be about 14 and three quarters inches. So I'm guessing that um, that is exactly what Merix is now selling. So just go to their site and have them send you the 14 inch bar if you don't wanna figure out what size it is. Um, otherwise it's just threaded rod. Um, Lori, as far as I know, my class at Harrisville has not been canceled. It's in October and I think um, we're still, I know it's full, but I think they're still waiting to see what happens. So I don't know what's going to happen on that. Um, the conference I was going to teach in um, 
Yeah, there's another conference in the fall that um, I think that the word isn't out on it yet. But um, anyway, I don't know about Harrisville. And uh, I think we're going to wait on that one. And what was the rest of your question? Oh, can someone audit for one day? That's a question for Harrisville. I don't know if they um, allow that at all. So um, ask that, email them and uh, they'll probably email me and then we'll figure it out. Um, yeah, so Janice saw the same Helena show that I saw. It was pretty amazing, wasn't it? The thing that was so great about that in my memory, seeing Helena Herrenmark's work at the American Swedish Institute, which is in Minneapolis. And if you're ever in Minneapolis, go to the American Swedish Institute. It's a beautiful place. And they have one of her tapestries permanently installed in the um, entryway right by their cafe. So you can at least see one of them for sure. And um, um, anyway, the thing for me was that I got to spend three days with Helena and she walked us through a couple times through the galleries and talked about her work. And it was, it was really amazing. I believe I did a blog post about it. So um, I'll put a link in the thing for that. Oh yeah, <laughs> Ruth says I did a blog post. So if Ruth says it, I must have done it. Um, yeah, she's really inspiring. It's not the Theo Mormon technique, uh, PJ. I think that Janet Austin is right on when she says it's a, um, a brocade, a type of brocade. And she did use to use Rose Path for sure, which is just a traveling sequence that gave her a little bit of a different look, but, um, awesome. So... It's not the Theo Mormon. Well, you know what? I guess, Dorothy, I don't know specifically enough about the Theo Mormon technique to answer for sure. I believe that's also a form of, is it another form of, no, I think they're different. I don't really know. Someone else will know. <laughs> Carol, somebody needs to invent a self-warping loom. You know, you can buy from Harrisville. This is funny. I've visited the Harrisville mill a lot of many times now, and they actually have a, a setup, a machine set up to warp those, um, those rigid heddle looms that they have for kids that come with the rainbow warps on them. You can actually send those looms back to them and they will rewarp them for you, which I think is hilarious, but they sell the loom warped. So that's the only instance I know of a self warping loom. I think it's, um, it's funny. Oh, Tapestry Knitter. Um, sorry, I can't remember your name. Um, as soon as you say it, I'm, it's going to come back to me. Um, the Saffron Loom. I've been meaning to show you this for days. Hold on. Let me see if I can find the picture. Uh, this is, hold on. This is why it's called the Saffron Loom. Isn't this great? I asked if I could show this and, and they said yes. Um, this is Saffron. Saffron is a puppy dog who belongs to, um, as a family member of, um, Claudia who owns Murex. So one of her family members actually, um, is making all the parts for this loom. And this is his dog, Saffron. Isn't she cute? So, um, that's her with the little loom in front of her. Um, so that's why it's called the Saffron Loom. Thank you. I have been meaning to show you that picture for a couple of weeks now. Um, oh, thanks, Audrey. Um, I think I haven't looked at that Weaver's Bazaar newsletter. I'll look at it. I um, really appreciate Weaver's Bazaar and they do often link to my stuff. They're really great. Um, their yarn is wonderful and it's fun to have tapestry friends in the UK. So, um, oh, Nora, that's a really great question. So, um, Nora's just, let me just um, show you this. Nora was asking whether I took the silk out here because I didn't put in the double half edges or because I didn't like it? And the answer is because I didn't like it. I just didn't like the bright, bright 
So the silk was this really bright color. And this is a, something I was thinking about, about a window, and I just, I just didn't like it at all. So I took it out because I didn't like it. I added the half hitches because I'm going to leave these warps unwoven. And I wanted the half hitches there to hold the weft in place so it doesn't slide around when it comes off the loom. I would not have used half hitches with the silk in there and I won't put the silk back in. Hopefully that answers that question. Oh yeah, Mary, that's right. Sayari weaving, you can get pre-wound warps. So those Sayari looms are pretty, pretty cool. If you don't know what that is, S-A-O-R-I, just uh, Google that up and you'll learn more about this sort of freeform weaving. I think it started with someone who was um, trying to make looms in a weaving approach for people with developmental disabilities. I might be making this up in my head, but it seems like that's the story. But now they're quite popular and um, a lot of fun. It's a floor loom. It sits on the floor. It's made of metal and has, um, you know, back beams and front beams. And um, So, yes, Saffron. Here's one more peek at Saffron, if I can find her again. Here we go. Um, that's, that's Dear Saffron. Um, cool. Um, so, thanks, you guys. I have rambled on yet again. I think today's Thursday, right? So um, just orienting myself. Tomorrow's Friday. I will be here tomorrow and then I will be here on Monday and we will see how things go from there. Um, Colorado is backing off on their stay at home stuff, but um, a little bit. It looks like a slow process. So starting sometime next week, but I will still be here and I hope that you do some weaving or whatever else you're doing to um, make things and stay sane. Um, cool. Kathleen, that's a good question. Um, fire that at me again tomorrow and we'll, uh, I'll talk about it because I have this piece also I wanted to talk about um, tomorrow. Wait. Where's the camera? Um, this came off the loom like this. So I wanted to work on finishing it. So fire that finishing piece at me again uh, tomorrow or I'll make a note about it. And, um, and we'll talk about it then. So thanks you all. Thanks for coming. It really, um, it's fun to say hello to you every day. It makes me feel a little more connected to um, weavers out there and uh, have fun with your looms and figure stuff out and share it with each other and um, we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>